What stays in the mind of anyone who's been forgiven? Gratitude? No. It's the embarrassment, the most powerful activator in human history. Say you find someone in your outfit has been skimming, or cutting without permission, or plain old stealing from the cash take. Yet you decide the guy had trouble, that he worked hard for years before, that rather than concrete boots, he should be given platform shoes. Yes, raise him up with high expectations as you forgive him. Will he repent and sin no more? Will he be happy you forgave him? No, he will never forgive you. Why is that? Remember, from that day forward, every time you meet, your knowing smile will remind him again how far above him that you are. It's doubly embarrassing. And let's not forget how much trouble embarrassment causes. Wars have been fought over just embarrassment. Those conflicts certainly dragged on pointlessly because of the embarrassment of surrender. The Japanese, we know, would rather die. And you can see that Putin doesn't take embarrassment easily. But this is a criminal advisory. So let's keep it individual. A couple of people come to mind who took their embarrassment to extreme levels. Last week in the UK, half-wit near Monobrow, Jordan McSweeney, was given a 38-year minimum for murdering young Zara Alina. As she walked home one night, McSweeney didn't know the law student but gave her a decent kicking before finishing her off. He had not long been released from prison, inside for violence, but you can see that from his knobhead selfies that he put about. At his trial, he was too embarrassed to move from the cells to the courtroom dock to face the court. Did he kill Zara out of embarrassment? I haven't bothered to check, but I can see that it was so. And here's a story I know from first-hand experience. I met a guy many years ago. He was just, uh, well, 12 years into a life sentence. It was a full life sentence. That was in Melbourne's old Pentridge prison. It was J Division, a, a newly renovated ex-punch factory within the massive complex. Experimental, carpeted cells, wood panelling, swimming pool, kitchens, a tennis court as good as it ever got in Australia, even today. I and mean, people don't talk about the good places, do they? Anyway, Tony had no understanding of the world and its people. He latched onto any praised fashion, in style or entertainment, hoping devotion and imitation would give him a personality. Tony was easy enough to live with, as most lifers are. Usually... Murdering lifers are your best jailhouse people. They accept that this is their world. They keep their mouths shut, turn a blind eye to all manner of peculiar ways, amongst other inmates, and are quiet. The most important thing. Yet, what makes them so relaxed, so easygoing? Well... For them, when days are slow and they're going hard, they always have the quiet satisfaction that at one time, for a short but lasting moment, they choke the living daylights out of someone who no longer walks this earth. And back to Tony. His murder happened when he was just 22, at a party, a big, drinky, two-story house bash in the suburbs, at one point, the vivacious flirt of the party turned her attentions on Tony. As she led him by the hand up the curved staircase, there were cheers from the crowd below. A tire safety rope to Tony's ankle, someone called, unshiverously. Good luck, mate. 
said another. Around fifteen minutes later, the bedroom door was thrown open. The girl giddily stepped out and held onto the rail, calling out to the party goers below, What a flop! she yelled. Someone send me up a real man. Tony skulked into the garden. After around thirty minutes, the lifeless body of the party girl was found by chance, half dragged into the garage, two dozen stab wounds. A kitchen knife, a turkey carver, was found hurriedly hidden in a bedroom chimney, I recall. Tony was arrested. The words frenzied attack were used. Tony didn't help his case in court by giving any backstory, and was led by a lazy lawyer into the moment of madness defence. He made no statement and didn't defend himself at all in court. The judge did not get to hear, as I did, that as a teenager Tony had dodged going to school because his family had bought him an unfashionable brand of jeans. Yet he pretended each day to go to school, too embarrassed to admit his shame at not having Levi's, too embarrassed to argue with his parents, too shy to trade for what he wanted, and certainly too embarrassed to bring up his past before a sentencing judge. I told Tony he could save himself ten years with the dozen admissions of cringing embarrassment he'd admitted just to me. But he'd rather die than appear so weak, or kill if it came to it. The girl who publicly humiliated Tony became his immediate target. Now, someone you humiliate at work won't necessarily carve you up in the company car park, but the seed of resentment and hatred is planted. You know, too, that humiliation comes in many forms. There are those who feel humiliated simply by the existence of someone more stylish, more followed, more photographed. Look at Instagram, that polygraph of vanity. Now, let's back away from the extreme to an equally surefire way of making a target of yourself. Many times, sadly in a long smuggling career, I would discover something unpleasant about a trusted worker. That is, I trusted they'd behave in a conventionally dishonest way, steal and skim within the 10% limit for lower level trades, and no more than 25% where the trade doubled the take at each level transaction. What I mean is, importing at a higher level domestic trades of coke or weed or oranges <laughs> with more modest gains demanded a little more honesty. This skim was accepted, not mentioned, the honest 10% of deceit. But what would I do when I discovered substitutions or double dealing with my contacts, contacts the worker was simply meant to meet and drop or meet and collect. There were times when clumsy, dishonest moves would harm my business and insult me along the waterfront, making me, therefore, a target for extortionists. Should I make some movie land spectacle of stringing the cheater up? And what would that do since I'd be the obvious suspect? It certainly would gain nothing. Now, once you get a reputation for murder, there is only one recourse for your competitors. So bring that on at your own risk. There's a lot to be said for saying nothing at all when you unmask a traitor. And there is usually a case for saying nothing at all as in just about every matter. What could I get if I confronted him? A groveling apology? A promise of future good conduct? If I accepted the apology and promised privately, I'd be letting him know only this. Be careful next time, I'd seem to be saying, and admitting, but I'm still a mug, someone you can cheat. Mm. Look to the domestic world. The woman who forgives a man's infidelity 
only sets the terms of the next philandering. The woman, in turn, who is forgiven for her own affair, must then live with a heavy cloud of suspicion for every unaccounted hour, as well as the pain of being silently labelled a tramp from polite breakfast to soundless supper. An unbearable state that demands the knife of greater betrayal. Forgiveness. So, do I let others in the underground group know that he's been caught with his hand in the jar and he's now on probation? That he's not sleeping with the fishes because he'd given many years of loyal service and promises to be a good boy? I'd never caught him before. What would that tell the others? You know very well it weakens your position. And remember this, at every instance of meeting or transaction or a group gathering debriefing, there he will sit, the sinner who has been forgiven but now watched, never quite trusted again. He will never forgive you for that. Forgiving him was unforgivable. Here's your choice, whether it be discovering a cheating partner or disloyal servant, his or her public forgiving will stoke the embarrassment to the point of explosion. Of course, you could push them out, but they will go on to talk to others and work for the opposition. And people will know you're weak if they keep on walking. Do you take to the gun? Well, as pleasing as that might feel, it is, as often, just a failure of the imagination. There is, in the end, only one use for your traitor, and that is to betray. It's what he does. But in this case, you decide what falsehoods he will spread, what form that betrayal will take. And if your imagination is deep, you can use him to save you from your worst enemies. The trick to this is to make him believe he alone has discovered your secret. A cheat is a gambler, and a gambler believes only they can see the truth others try to conceal. He convinces himself it is he, your own traitor, whom the competition, the ruthless family chief, or even the chief of police, will believe. Because he believes. So, you now have the chance to mould those false beliefs to your advantage. In the open world, Forgiveness is just some hollow church ritual. In the dark world of reality, forgiveness is simply loosening the pin of your last grenade. And by friend or foe, one thing's for sure, you'll never be forgiven. <laughs>